Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Uh, I am Srikant, part of Cashless Consumer. Uh, welcome to the first of the webinar series that we have planned uh, on all things payments and fintech. Uh, for those who are new to Cashless Consumer, for those who are new to Cashless Consumer, uh, we are a consumer collective uh, who are interested in tracking all things digital payments to increase awareness, uh, understand technology produce consumed data around payments, uh, represents consumers in the policy of digital payments ecosystem uh, to voice consumer perspectives and concerns the goal of moving towards a fair cashless society. Uh, you could read uh, more about our work uh, on our website uh, www.cashlessconsumer.in. Uh, some housekeeping comments before we get started. Uh, please use the Q&A on the Zoom if you're on Zoom or uh, post your questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, we'll get them answered towards the end of the talk. Uh, so today's uh, webinar will look into the IFSC toolkit by Razorpay. And we will discuss uh, how developers can make use of this IFSC data using the API the toolkit provides. We have Nemo Alais Aberana, maintainer of the open source project behind the IFSC.lacerpay.com. Uh, to talk more about it, uh, I'll hand over to, to Nemo. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nemo. I do tech and security things at Lacerpay. Uh, Today, I'm going to be talking about the Razor Pay IFSC toolkit, but in general about IFSC codes and how they work, uh, what's the history behind it, and the various kind of internal things that you may not usually get uh, to hear about or understand uh, just from a consumer perspective. Uh, as users, you know, you've used IFSC codes from, to making payments to, you know, add a beneficiary or while making a, a UPA payment even. Uh, but how did it actually work uh, and what's the underlying uh, tech stack behind it and what does our toolkit offer, et cetera. Uh, I'll go through all of those things. Uh, so uh, the starting point is the IFSC toolkit which we released uh, four years ago. Uh, this is the page as it looked then and as it almost looks now. Uh, we pushed a blog post out telling why we built it, but the primary use case was validation of IFSC goals. Uh, so before we start, uh, since this is all about IFSC, uh, what does IFSC stand for? You know, uh, the obvious answer would be, you know, it's a banking code, so Indian financial something something. C4 codes. Uh, as it turns out, uh, there's another IFSC code. Uh, there's another abbreviation for IFSC that RBI has mandated, uh, RBI has published recently, uh, creating something called an International Financial Services Center. Uh, RBI is trying to create a special economic zone of some kind, which basically um, provides incentives uh, to financial companies and the banking companies to set up their infra or set up their uh, presence within India. Uh, to support uh, international finance in general. Uh, that's also an IFSC. Uh, but yeah, today we're not gonna be talking about that kind of IFSC. We're gonna be sticking to the Indian Financial System Code. Uh, can I switch it to full screen? Uh, yep. Oh, I think the green line is because of Zoom, but I think that's fine, we can manage. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about the Indian Financial System Code, which is basically the IFSC code as we know it. Uh, or this is how exactly we identify banking branches in India. Uh, so we're gonna be splitting this talk in roughly three parts. Uh, first, I'm gonna be talking about the project, uh, what it does, what it's about, how we maintain it. Uh, second part is gonna be about accessories in the background in terms of uh, what all goes behind the scenes, uh, how are they maintained, uh, what does the RBI do, what's the role of the NPCI and so on. And third is gonna be future scope collaboration ideas in terms of uh, how we can in general uh, build better APIs, uh, build better open collaboration systems for FinTech in India. Okay, uh, so some metrics we've been doing this for four years. Uh, first release was in 2016. Uh, it was an internal project before that. Uh, we have had uh, 64 releases, 64 plus releases since our 72 ish tags, uh, multiple languages, uh, 7,000 is line of code. Uh, not a lot of it is actually code, a lot of it is just data. And the primary use case for the uh, entire toolkit is uh, data. Uh, having an open public data set that supports uh, validation that lets you know whether an IFSC is live or not. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of is uh, starting from the November release, uh, November 2016 release, I started adding a little photos of cute animals in uh, every release to make the internet a cuter place. Uh, and as a consequence, I, uh, if you go ahead and search for an IFSC code today, uh, on Google image search. Uh, these are the kind of photos that show up. Uh, 
And as a consequence of this, uh, I can present to you now the ICC wall of cuteness, which is uh, all the uh, cute animal decks uh, that which you obviously search for access codes uh, on Google image search. Um, if the uh, uh, slides lag behind, please let me know. Uh, okay, so coming back to the CSI of things, uh, what is the toolkit? Uh, the primary part of the toolkit is an API that is served publicly at ifsc.jsap.com. Uh, the primary use case for the API as of now is validating IFSC codes. So if you're building a service which requires a user to type in an IFSC code uh, and you want to fetch in details or we want to validate, uh, you can use this. Uh, there's a data set uh, to the toolkit which is published on every release. It's a moving data set, which means every release is regenerated from scratch. Uh, on top of this, this data set is present in multiple formats. Uh, the data set includes all the things that you would expect from uh, knowing an IFSC and getting more details about it. But on top of just consuming and pro uh, providing IFSC codes, you also provide data around banks in general. Uh, on top of the data set, there is an SDK, which lets you do all of these things via code. So you can validate your IFSC codes, you can make requests to the API, you can do offline bank checks, you can get additional information about a specific bank and so on, all of this in code. And uh, all of these SDKs are available in uh, multiple languages. Uh, there are also a few folks which support additional languages. We are trying to upstream them. Uh, yeah. uh, so if that's the data, uh, what's the primary source? Uh, one of the guiding principles behind making this was uh, finding out the official sources and ensuring that all of those are directly used as is. Uh, if you search for, you know, IFSC codes in India, you will get a lot of third party sources on the internet, uh, but none of them actually document where the upstream data is coming from, when it is getting updated and so on. Uh, so one of the use cases and one of the guiding principles was to ensure that everything that we are using should be a, a public data set that's easily available and uh, making sure that the rest of the toolkit is open source so you can reproduce the same results. Uh, so the primary uh, data source is the RBI website, which provides Excel sheets for two data sources. Uh, which is the NEST and the RTGS datasets. Both of them include details about uh, various branches of India. Uh, uh, both of these include uh, details about each and every branch within India of multiple banks, all the banks that are registered with the RBI, uh, their NEST details uh, or and or the RTGS details. Uh, NEST and RTGS, just you mean, I'm sure everyone knows the difference, but in general, if you're trying to make higher uh, amount transactions, you have to switch from NEST to RTGS, which has uh, different limits. Uh, NBCA also publishes a few lists that we consume. Uh, the primary uh, source is the all live ACH member banks list, which is the NACH uh, member banks list of all the member banks in the NACH network. Uh, this list includes a lot of details about uh, various banks, uh, such as their primary ICC code, uh, which is important for certain use cases. Uh, NBCA also publishes a list, list of all the UPI live member banks. Uh, which is basically the list that you see when you open any UPI app and you try to add a new bank account. Uh, there's also a list of NBIN codes, uh, which I'll get to later on, uh, which was published in the IMBS procedural guidelines 1.7. Uh, these are the primary data sources we use, uh, but we're also open to using other data sets. Uh, so for example, if a bank has a specific uh, data set, so for example, uh, uh, SBA website, uh, has its own list of, you can go to the SBA website and type in a few details about a bank branch and get more details about it back in return. And it turns out that some of the details mismatch against what is published on the RBA website. And because it's the own SBA website, uh, those details are sometimes more accurate than what's present in the RBA website. And as such, we try to do an amalgamation of seeing which is the better data set in such cases. Um, so yeah. Uh, in any other sources, uh, we use interim RBA circulars in terms of uh, RBA publishers circular saying, hey, this bank is now called that and that, or some and so, uh, so and so banks are being merged, some banks are being shut down. Uh, any procedural guidelines that we show from BCA in terms of uh, IMPS being shut off for a few banks, or uh, uh, any other public sources on the NPCI website itself, and a few specific RBA and BCI circulars as they come out. NPCI uh, should not be NCPI. Uh, so yeah, what's the data? Uh, once we consume all these data from different sources, the idea is to publish a singular data source you can use uh, as the source of truth for any of the use cases that you have. Uh, so this is a list of all the files that we include every release. Uh, the primary, the first one is the banks.json file, uh, which is a list of all banks in India, uh, primarily based on the NPCI ACH list, uh, but we try to uh, add in additional things as well. Uh, 
so for example, the UPS support over here is published on a different page and then you merge all of this together. Uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, for example, for the SBI and bank, uh, we know what the bank code is. We know we get a bank type. Uh, I'll get to details on this later. Uh, we get a primary IMBS SSE. So in case uh, uh, you want to know what the SSE for the primary bank branch is, usually the head office branch, uh, this is provided. The MICR code similarly again for the primary bank branch. Uh, the IN, which you may also have heard of as the bin number for a bank. Uh, this is the first six digits of the primary issuer number for the bank. So uh, a bank may have registered multiple INs. Uh, since these are coming from MPCI, these are the rupee INs usually. Uh, whether or not the bank supports other payment spread system, so it becomes a true false flag, uh, a few other flags. And finally, whether or not the bank is available on UPI or not. Uh, so this file by itself gives you a lot of data corresponding to all the banks that we are aware of, currently 1,400-ish banks, uh, saying what all is supported on a bank, what kind of bank it is, and so on. Uh, finally, uh, the next file is a buy bank file, which provides various details about all the bank branches of a specific bank. Uh, this is the basically the data that we actually publish on the final uh, API. So if you were to open ffc.atabay.com slash paytm001, this is uh, the response that you basically get uh, from here to here. Uh, it tells you what the bank name is, what the access code is, what the branch is, if you're referring to a specific, because you're referring to a specific branch, what's the address, uh, if you have a contact number for it, and what all, uh, so whether it supports IMPS, RTGS, and EFT, and whether we have an IMIC of code for the branch. Uh, I'll get to uh, more details later on what all it does what, but it gives you basically a gesture of what all uh, is supported on a specific branch, what are details. So this is, uh, this API also supports uh, course. So in case you're using making a front-end only app, you can actually just make a direct request from the browser to this uh, endpoint and get the details and pre-fill these for your customers, for example. This is what we do, for example, when a, a consumer show, a, a merchant shows up on our on dashboard and they fill in the details saying, hey, this is my office code. Uh, we pre-fill all these details, um, the branch address, etc. Uh, and for example, if you have certain limitations uh, saying, uh, if you're pushing out your transactions, or if you're pushing out your remittances to the specific uh, bank branch via this or FTHS or uh, NEFT, so you can disable enable accordingly. So you can say, uh, you given me an IFC code, but that doesn't support an AFT. I'm going to be making a transfer on EFT. And as such, this doesn't match. Please provide me a different IFC code. Uh, we publish a single list of all the IFC codes. So this will be basically a link, a huge JSON file with all the IFC, known IFC codes. Uh, we publish uh, FSC.CSV file. Um, this is a single CSV file containing all the things. Uh, the, all the fields are basically same as over here. So all of the things on the left over here become headers. Uh, and uh, this is a fairly large uh, CSV file. Uh, the use case for this primarily becomes because there are three different data sets that we try to cover. We are covering NEFT, RDGS, as well as IMPS payments. And having a single unified CSV file makes it uh, much more easier for anyone to consume things. Uh, we publish a single IFSC.json file. This is the one that is the primarily used for validations of all IFSC codes. So if you have uh, ADCC as the, as the bank branch, uh, it provides you a list of all the possible uh, bank uh, branch codes that are supported. So in this case, uh, we support the 0, so ADCC 0001 to ADCC 0016 uh, by virtue of this list. All of these are valid uh, IFSC codes. Uh, FSCs in general form, follow a standard format. So you go with four characters of the bank uh, code, of, which are all alphabetical, followed by one zero, uh, which is a reserve bit as of now, uh, followed by six digits, uh, six alphanumeric digits. Uh, uh, there are actually some places on the internet where you may find, you know, uh, uh, you try to enter an FSC code and they do not take an alphanumeric uh, value as the last six, uh, but it's not as per the standard in general. Uh, IFSC codes as well as account numbers within India everywhere should support alphanumeric values. Uh, we also publish a bank names.json file, which is basically a manually human curated list of all bank names. Uh, this is pretty helpful when you have a UI to build uh, and you want to show a user a list of banks. Uh, and uh, in our system, for example, within the user, the users everywhere, uh, you have a specific uh, four character code and you want to showcase a list of bank names. Uh, this is what we use. And the, uh, we ensure that the list is as human readable as possible. So even though we take in data sets from multiple sources where they may have confusing names or where they may have uh, redundant names, for example, uh, you may often see Chamba Urban Cooperative Bank, comma, Chamba. 
uh, or you may see uh, places where uh, cooperators spell multiple ways and so on. Uh, so we have a single curated list, uh, which which makes sure that all the bank names are written down, written down uh, in the same manner, so it's easy to consume. Uh, the API itself, uh, once again, and this is how it responds, uh, similar to how I'd shown the ATM example. If you send a request to fcdrsb.com slash the FC code, it'll give you all the details, including branch, center, district, uh, state address. Uh, some of the details are not available for all FC codes, and that's just a consequence of uh, merging different data sets. So we either put in a NA for all those cases. In some cases, we won't have, for example, the app, my CEO code, and so on, um, but yeah. That's just how it is. Uh, this is how it usually works. Uh, you don't need to understand code, but in general, uh, we support the same things across multiple languages. So if you want to validate our FCC code, uh, the important thing about this check is it happens offline, and it, it is a much more uh, better check than what you may have seen in other places. For example, uh, if you try to validate an FCC code, and I've seen regexes to try to do this by taking the first two characters and saying, hey, uh, are the first four characters alphabetical, and is the fifth character a zero? Uh, then yes, uh, 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 they mark it as a valid FSC, but unfortunately that's not true because FSC codes get retired, uh, they may have blanks, uh, just having a four character valid code does not ensure that FSC will be valid. For example, ATM 00001 is a valid FSC, but ATM 002 is not. Uh, uh, two is now, I think, but five is not, for example. So uh, it, it differs. So with this check, however, on the other hand, make sure that the FC code is actually valid as per the latest data set that you have currently installed locally. Uh, so a question from someone uh, asking, yes, this is a, a this is a public and open source data set. Uh, all of this is there. If you go to fsc.raiserpay.com, uh, you should be able to get all the links. So and we also support things like getting a bank name from a specific uh, from a specific bank code. So if you do uh, a get name for PUNB, it returns my average bank. All these are uh, happen offline. Uh, we also support constants, uh, which is if you work in fintech, it much makes things much much more easier uh, for you because you're talking to specific banks very often, uh, and uh, makes things much more easier in general. Having a constant to refer to a specific bank across your entire code base. Uh, and if you want to get details, uh, this again happens offline, and you can get details of a specific bank and tells you all the things. Uh, so if you want to get the FSC code for Punjab National Bank in general, uh, there's a way to do that. Uh, finally, you can also do uh, over the internet lookups. Uh, the lookup, of course, happens over the internet. Uh, it makes a request to fsc.reservate.com, gets back all the details that you would want. Uh, and again, all of this is supported over multiple languages, so you can do a validation and node uh, you can fetch details from the internet, uh, have constants in node, and similarly things for Ruby, et cetera. Uh, we also support, and the support metrics currently, what all features are supported across different SDKs. Uh, so there's some uh, different level of supports, but the primary use cases, which are validation and the API client, can you validate it given IFC code? And can you uh, fetch details given an IFC of uh, get things like contact or address of a branch? Um, those are primary to use because we try to support across every SDK. Uh, this is a chart I made a while back, not highly accurate, uh, plus minus five, 10 percent ish. Uh, but in general, uh, this is the growth chart in terms of the number of IFC codes on the desk uh, in, in, across every release, um, broken down by release date. Uh, but in general, it's, it's a slowly rising chart. Uh, I think we have crossed 150,000 now. Uh, but uh, depends on what RBI is doing on a month to month basis. The releases happen usually uh, monthly uh, from the RBI. That is when we try to do uh, more releases. That we, uh, we try to follow the RBI guidelines. Uh, and whenever RBI pushes a release, we push out a new a release as well. Uh, so, uh, plan learnings. When we started this whole project, we had a few set of ideas in terms of where we wanted this project to go. Uh, the first was having a polyglot single repo, which is basically the idea of ensuring how can we have a, a primary data source as well as SDKs for all the different languages in a single uh, repository. If we've managed to do that. Uh, how do we have, the second was about having an open data super fast public API. Uh, the API is actually very, very fast. It's one of the things that we don't have to worry about maintaining much. Uh, it consumes very few resources and we, we it runs on top of just mem in memory database. It's been really fast and easy and nice. Uh, the third was a scapegoat application for random tests uh, because the 
uh, as a CAP as a, as a source, it doesn't have a, it, it acts stateless for us, uh, which means we can actually play around a lot with it internally at RaceAPI in terms of uh, using it for additional testing or getting it to a different uh, cluster and things like that. Uh, this is how uh, the polyglot thing, for example, shows up in practice. Uh, we have, uh, and the source directory has files from Elixir, Node, PHP, uh, lots of JSON files which are used across all uh, languages. We have things from Ruby and so on. Uh, try to ensure that every uh, single code base exists within the same repository instead of having different uh, uh, different repositories for different languages. Makes it things makes releases much more easier. Um, there were a lot of unplanned learning as well. Uh, this is where I'm going to be talking about uh, how the FC works in the background. What are the different uh, principles that are involved, what are the different entities that are involved. Uh, uh, these are things that I was not expecting to learn. Uh, when we did started doing FinTech back in 2015, uh, we didn't, we were all new to the FinTech field. And uh, these are the things that you learned along the way. So the first is, um, there are actually too many banks in India. Uh, our current uh, bank name JSON file holds 1400 plus banks. Uh, if we add additional banks from various other sources, which are currently not in the file, it adds up easily to 2,500 plus banks within India. Uh, not all banks are completely recognized by the RBI. Uh, India doesn't have a concept. Uh, if you want to do a bank in any way in India, you do have to register with the RBI, but not everything is recognized by the RBI with a four letter code. I'll get into more details soon. But uh, the, if you add up all the banks, it adds up to a lot. Uh, we have uh, different tiers of banks within our country. Uh, on top of the usual banks that you heard of, there are district cooperative banks, we have state cooperative banks, uh, we have foreign banks that can do banks in India, and so on. And it, it adds up a lot. Uh, RB is actually trying to do a lot of things in this regard. They're trying to uh, shut down a lot of uh, small cooperative banks, uh, which were not being pro uh, profitable. They're trying to shut down uh, rural regional banks, uh, which are called as RLBs, and uh, trying to merge them together into a single PSP and so on. Uh, so this is uh, something that I'm also seeing evolving as you know how to how to manage the FCC codes, etc. Uh, as these banks change, uh, the eleven different kinds of banks in India, uh, which is a lot. Uh, we have uh, this is what you'll get if you take the ACH list from the NPCA website. Uh, we have DCCBs, which are lots of different kinds of cooperative banks: just cooperative banks, urban cooperative banks, uh, state urban cooperative banks, state cooperative banks, and uh, the payment banks. You may have uh, heard a lot in the news, uh, things like Paytm, Airtel payments, and so on. Um, we also have local area banks and uh, small finance banks. Uh, and finally, you have foreign banks, which can be entities that are registered outside India but want to operate as a bank within India for reasons. So yeah, diff 11 different kinds of banks. Uh, and finally, you have public sector banks, which uh, are the entities like PNB, SBA, et cetera. And regional rural banks are the small banks, which RBA started out actually as an experiment in the 70s on the idea that uh, it would make banking much more cheaper and easier for the rural economy of India. Uh, and uh, the experiment has, had, uh, recently I believe there was a report which basically said uh, RRBs are much harder to be profitable and running an RRB is, becomes uh, very, very hard for RBA to sustain in general. So as such, we are trying to shut it down and merge with NPSPs, which are actually doing a much better job of uh, supporting rural, rural banking within India. So, uh, on other learnings, RBI has, doesn't have much idea what it's doing. Uh, this is an easy example. Uh, there are two different codes for uh, Indian Post Payments Bank, um, both of them from different sources. Both of them are correct, both of them are valid. Only one of them has an RFC assigned under it, but both of them are technically uh, IPOS and IPPB. Both are Indian Post Payments Bank. So if you look up either of them, uh, you get the same response. Uh, very often you'll see this happen uh, with uh, cooperative banks as well. Uh, so the way four-letter codes work within uh, the RBA system is, uh, you, if you have uh, RBA is supposed to give you out the four-letter code, uh, and uh, usually though, uh, if you are a small bank that is not actually connected to the RBI in many ways, you get a four-letter code that ends in an X. And if the bank decides to upgrade itself, the older code remains, and uh, this results in different co conflicting codes for the same banks. Uh, now you may have assumed by that, you know, AJUX, okay, that's a cooperative bank, small cooperative bank, not connected. Uh, don't really have, that's the general principle you usually go with uh, because it's a not connected bank, a small bank, it won't have any accuracy codes. Uh, as it turns out, there are actually banks, uh, uh, 
for example, the chartered Psycho Reed Bank uh, in Niamita uh, that has the FSC code or the bank code that starts CSBX, um, but it's directly supported on the IMPS network. It's not listed by the RBI, so RBI does not know of the presence of the specific IFSC code, uh, but it's a valid IFSC code that only supports IMPS. Uh, so my mental model changed at this point. Okay, maybe banks with uh, ending with X can have uh, uh, IMPS, but not RBI mandated like things. But as it turns out, there are other banks uh, where this uh, also does not hold up. So it's more of a thumb rule saying, uh, if you have a bank code that ends in an X, it can, doesn't have connectivity. But in the case of uh, KOEX, which is the KB HANA Bank, uh, it has connectivity across RTGS, IMPS, and EFT uh, with an access code that actually starts with an X. So RBI doesn't actually, like RBI has a thumb rule of thoughts, but it doesn't always necessarily follow it. Uh, the other learning which I had was that the NPCA doesn't actually come under the RTI. Um, there was a huge judgment around it uh, last year. Uh, the case was uh, taken up by the CIC, which is the Competition Commission of India and uh, CCI, uh, uh, around whether or not the NPCA comes in under as a public body or not. Uh, uh, you can go and read the link judgment, but uh, uh, the uh, court has ruled that as of yet, NPCA doesn't come under the RTI, which means if you're looking to get certain specific data sets from the NPCI, uh, the right way to do that currently is to actually approach the uh, public authority for NPCI, which is the RBA or the minus Ministry of Finance, uh, which is what I've been trying to do, uh, file an RTA by the RBA to get data sets, which are uh, kind of not public yet. Uh, the other learning was around MICR codes. Uh, the IFSC data set when we first released it in 2016 didn't actually support MICR codes. MICR, if you're not aware of it, is the Magnetic and Character Recognition Code. Uh, this is a nine-digit code that is printed on all your checks. And it's printed with a magnetic ink, which makes it much more easier for uh, uh, automated systems to recognize and pass the check. Uh, and uh, other, like if for FSCs, the first four characters immediately give you the bank code. But in this case, because a check uh, clearinghouse uh, works on a different manner, the check clearinghouse works uh, more location-wise than a bank-wise. So you'll have a check clearing house being run, which will cater to different banks uh, within the same city, uh, which is why the first digits are much more uh, are city dependent than you go to the bank than you go to the branch. Uh, it was a decent system while it was it was built pre ifsc uh, but it doesn't hold out because the number of branches and the number of banks are much more limited. Uh, but uh, as it turns out, MICR is still being used uh, for various different reasons. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, we have had issues in this, and then people showed up and said, hey, on the FSC API, this is the MICR code, and uh, it's not showing up, blah, blah. Uh, can you fix it? And it turns out people still use it. Uh, next, we have the IBN codes, uh, which are the international standards for how uh, banking codes must work. Uh, IBN, in general, uh, the format that is followed is two characters of an ISO code for a country. So in our case, for example, it will just be IN. Um, there's a check digit, which can be used for validation on uh, an easy basis saying whether or not the number that you've given is correct or not, uh, followed by a bank code, uh, followed by an account number. Uh, that's the standard uh, format that an IBAN code has. Uh, there was a committee that was formed a while back by the Ministry of Finance to decide how IBAN codes within India will work. Uh, they looked in, uh, at a lot of different options. Uh, for example, whether we should allow alphanumeric uh, code account numbers, what's the minimum maximum account number length we should permit, uh, should we allow uh, the bank codes to be alphanumeric or not, et cetera. Uh, and uh, the, I've linked it over here, uh, .in structure, uh, but it's a very good read in terms of what's the actual coverage of how account numbers and bank codes in India look like. Uh, and ultimately they fall back to the maximum, which is having support for 18 digits in the account number uh, and keeping those digits as alphanumeric because there's a lot of account numbers in India that are alphanumeric in nature, not just numeral. Uh, so this is the official IBAN number structure in India. So if you want to uh, have an IBAN number, which may be required for routing uh, internationally in some cases, um, this is what you can follow. You can take the uh, bank code, which you already know from an FSC, uh, remove the zero, uh, put in the list of the route numbers, and you pad it with uh, zeros to make it get to 18 digits. Uh, the next thing I found out was bank mergers. Uh, bank mergers uh, happen, uh, have been happening quite frequently uh, since I started this. We have had multiple banks being merged to SBI. We have had multiple banks being merged within PNB. Uh, there's also silent mergers that don't show up 
in the normal news uh, where an RRB will be shut down and be merged to another RRB. Uh, I believe this has happened in Telangana, where uh, as well as Bihar, uh, where the Dakshin, Madhyam, uh, Madh, and the South uh, Dakshin East, there are three different uh, bank, rural regional banks within Bihar, and all of those were merged to make a single bank, uh, and so on. But you don't usually get to hear about these, and how to handle this becomes important as you see a tranche of assets is becoming invalid and new assets is showing up, uh, so it becomes interesting. So, and each bank merger has to be handled differently. Depending, it basically depends on finding out the right uh, source and the find reaching out to the right people and saying, hey, uh, are these assets going to become invalid? Are these going to remain valid? So in the case of SBI, which is the most uh, famous example, SBI said we will support uh, inward IMP transactions for one month, but uh, uh, and uh, the assets could still remain valid for a short time. But after that, you need to switch out uh, to the correct IFRC. Uh, naming banks is hard. Uh, they're just in the, in the 1400-ish list of named banks that I maintain. Uh, there are 20 different ways to write cooperative, cooperative, uh, cooperative without a dash, and lots of different other ways. Uh, you'll have different ways of writing the word district in different uh, formats of uh, Zilla in general. Uh, the Hindi translation for cooperative becomes Sahikari, and uh, there are different ways of spelling out Sahikari. Uh, and this this is fairly problematic because uh, the primary use case is to showcase a list of all the banks to a customer. So in case you have a list of bank codes that you want to show where you use it, and then seeing different ways of cooperative being spelled or different variations of Zilla uh, doesn't look nice. It makes for a very uh, inconsistent UX experience. So as such, I ended up writing guidelines on how to keep bank names consistent, which basically says, you know, you don't want private limited at the end of every bank name. Uh, and so on. Uh, the guidelines are uh, just guidelines, uh, but they don't. Uh, they ensure that all the bank names are consistent within the uh, data sets that we release. Uh, these are the general guiding principles that we had while doing releases. Make sure that the data set is current, which means if an IFSC is no longer valid, it should no longer be in the data set. Uh, this ensures that if uh, you have an IFSC today, uh, and it's not this valid, uh, and you validate it today, uh, there's a very high chance that the tra if, you're, if you make an inbound or an outbound transaction from that IFSC code, it should work. Uh, uh, the second is keep list of banks comprehensive and include dead banks. Um, this is something uh, we realized midway, I believe. Uh, we didn't used to support old banks, and then we realized there's still a lot of places where, for example, ING White Share Bank, which was merged to Kotak a while back, uh, it still shows up in a lot of places. Uh, both internally, externally, while we're dealing with partners and so on. And it makes it much more easier uh, to still have that on our list. Uh, third was only use official upstream sources. Uh, make sure that we're directly talking. We're not picking up, for example, uh, some random IFSC website on the internet. Uh, we're picking up data sets from either the banks themselves or from RBI and PCI and other official sources. Uh, this is what I found out about the IFSC issuance process. Uh, the way it works is when you register as a bank uh, within uh, the RBI network, uh, RBI issues you a four-letter bank code. Um, the four-letter code ends in an X for banks that are not connected to the RBI payment settlement systems. Uh, this happens usually via SFMS in case you're not connected to it, or which is the case for uh, small rural, rural banks, regional banks. Uh, your uh, assigned four-letter code will end in an X. Uh, there's an interconnect system between various banks in India called SFMS, uh, developed and built by RDBT, which is basically the technology wing of RBI. Uh, and uh, using SFMS, basically, different banks in the country can uh, push out the release, uh, push out an update uh, to the RBI. And then RBI collates all of this and publishes the final data sets into their website. Uh, independently of this entire process, uh, banks can inform in BCI of each and every IFSC they have uh, via NFS, which is the National Financial Switch. Uh, they have a different other mechanism for different uh, sources, for example, uh, with UBI, uh, UBI internally has this registration thing happening uh, for each and every bank. When you want to get on board, you have to provide your handle, and the list of handles is present over a metadata call and so on. Um, but basically, uh, each bank can inform and BCA independently of whatever RBA has issued them about each and every IFSC they support. And issuance within each and every branch code, which is to say that uh, given a four letter code, everything that happens underneath and any IFSC that starts with those four letters is basically owned by the bank. Uh, which means only the bank is responsible for whether or not 
uh, it's valid or not, or whether or not uh, it supports IMPS or IS or any of the and so on. Uh, having this split system where you know the RBA issuance process is independent of the NPCA uh, submission process uh, makes for interesting mix because some you'll have use case, you'll have cases where uh, an FSC code can have IMPS enabled on it because that is what the bank has submitted to NPCA. Uh, but that FSC code is not known at all um, by RBI because that was never submitted to uh, RBI in general. Uh, and it makes for like a, a disconnect. And uh, sometimes you'll have the same branch with multiple FSC codes and the bank may declare it as a headquarter branch bracket IMPS, which is what they have submitted to uh, our NPCI versus they'll have the same branch submitted with a different FSC code under NEFT and so on. Uh, fairly common. Uh, there are also lots and lots of different uh, codes. Uh, we started out just FSC. Uh, different FSC codes exist for NPS and NEFT. Uh, they're usually the same. In 99% of the cases, they will be the same. Uh, but in some cases, they may be different. And depends entirely on the bank because the bank owns it. Uh, MSCI codes, as I mentioned, are what gets printed on the checks. Uh, and uh, they form by city bank branch code, three digits each, or uh, all numeric. Uh, then you have the SWIFT, which you may also have seen as being referred to as the BIC codes. They are the international inbound transfer codes under the SWIFT network. Uh, so if you're doing international wire transfers, this is what your uh, a bank outside the India will usually ask for your SWIFT code. Uh, then you have the IBAN codes, which is the standardized way of referring to um, bank codes. Uh, they may or may not be the same for, as SWIFT code depending on your brand, on your bank. Uh, then you have the NBIN codes, which is the National Bank Identification. These are basically four-digit numeric codes uh, that uh, NPCI came up with primarily because uh, of how IMPS was built. Uh, so the way IMPS works is everything within IMPS tries to be as numeric as possible in order to ensure uh, the roots of, NP uh, of IMPS, which was to ensure mobile-based uh, payments. Uh, and Doing all of those is much more easier if you have everything as a digit. Unfortunately, the actual existing uh, FSC codes all have alphanumeric, which makes it much more harder to be used uh, within mobile phones. So, uh, which is why we have NBIN codes, just four digit numeric codes for every bank within India. Uh, and the NBIN codes get consumed within MMIDs, which you may have seen while trying to make uh, IMPS transfers. Uh, and that is, again, has this own thing, uh, own format where they try to make up uh, NBIN with a mobile account selector, which gives you your final actual uh, seven digit MMID. So yeah, lots of different ways of referring to a bank branch of you know, pointing out your account number within uh, uh, India. I also don't have lots of idea about what I'm doing. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot of things as I went along. For example, the NBN format uh, was something which we were trying to uh, decode for a long time. Uh, I've, uh, I've had a lot of attempts trying to you know, collate it with uh, the, uh, remember the three digit codes that you saw on MICO codes, I try to ensure that they were matching in some way or form, but it turns out they don't. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've tried a lot of different things over time. Uh, some of them have worked out, some of them have not, but I've learned a lot. Uh, NPC also doesn't have much idea what it's doing. And there are a lot of uh, uh, UPI handles, for example, uh, that are actually currently unknown uh, in the sense the issuing bank uh, behind these handles is uh, unknown. Uh, if you go to the UPI NPC website, there are two different places where uh, they have a list of all the banks that support UPI, which is what we consume. And then they have a list of all the known handles against uh, what all banks run these handles. Uh, and for some of the handles, there's no known issuing bank. Uh, most famously is the case with UPI because Beam is a separate app. It's not, it's not uh, run in partnership with any bank, uh, which makes uh, some of the downstream consequences tricky. For example, what happens to the MDR when you're making a payment over at the rate UPI handles? Uh, who is the issuing bank and uh, what happens to the issuing bank MDR in such cases, for example? Uh, RBI doesn't care much about data sanity. Uh, the Excel sheets that RBI uploads regularly have encoding issues. Uh, lots of lots of different encoding issues, uh, primarily UTF-8 issues. Uh, we try to fix for, we, we try to accommodate for a few of them, but not all. Uh, I'm hoping RBI fixes that those are there. And, uh, a lot of Excel sheets that they publish are also broke. Um, they'll have uh, uh, duplicate entries. They'll have uh, headers showing up in the middle. Um, they'll have uh, uh, FSC codes that are much longer, missing commas, and so on. Uh, they also, yeah, fairly broken. 
uh, people do occasionally show up and say, hey, please fix this. This is an encoding issue. Uh, but the point is, I don't want to make accommodation for too much of what uh, RBA is doing, and because then it becomes much more harder to maintain downstream. Uh, if the data set is uh, access a pipe saying, hey, this is the, what we what we take from the RBA and this is what we publish, makes things much more simpler and easier. So uh, the usual advice I give is to please reach out to the RBA and fix the data sets. Uh, the only change that I know of that has happened uh, on the RBA website is they've started putting this disclaimer, which didn't exist uh, maybe mid 2019, uh, at the bottom of the Excel sheet saying the data is compiled based on details furnished by the member banks, the SFMS portal. Uh, if you actually, the RBI website also started, uh, also built out a new tool where they let you search for a specific ISFC. Uh, unfortunately, if you go through the whole show and find an ISFC, RBA disclaims and says uh, the data is provided without any warranties of any kind. Uh, so, there's that. Uh, I've been trying to report all these issues with the RBI, but uh, uh, I've had this really long, long threads uh, going years at this point when I try to get them to uh, fix out the data sets. But uh, it's hard to get RBA to work uh, sometimes. Uh, and uh, nest blocks, which you may have heard about recently, uh, most famously from the uh, Yes Bank case, or where RBA decided to uh, push out saying, hey, uh, any FT transactions within Yes Bank are being dis uh, disallowed from such and such time and date. Uh, but these happen these happens slightly more often than uh, just the Yes Bank case. There are other banks as well. Uh, this is actually a snippet not from the Yes Bank a circular, but a different circular. Uh, which resulted in uh, FSC code of uh, uh, NFT uh, transfer be being blocked for six different banks. Uh, since then, I believe the blocks have been lifted. Um, but yeah, these are the kind of things that I also have to worry about and take care of uh, while making releases. Uh, getting to sublet branch for a little, uh, sublet branches for a little bit. Uh, this is a simple FCC code, uh, 11 characters. It assumes this is an HDFC code because of starts with HDFC, but it's not. If you make a request to fsc.rsp.com slash this FCC code, uh, you get uh, the bank name as Solapur Social Album Cooperative Bank, and the bank code is SSLX. Uh, this is one of the most uh, interesting learnings that I've had over time, which is that uh, given an FCC code, you can't currently tell which bank is uh, actually uh, behind this FCC code. Uh, easily. And this is, for example, uh, the two different sources that we figure out for our sublet identification. A sublet branch is basically a branch uh, run by a small bank, uh, basically a branch that is posing to be a small bank within uh, the RBI or the NPCI networks. So in this case, the entire Solapult Social Urban Cooperative Bank exists within a single RSC code. So if you are an account holder within uh, the bank, uh, you basically have uh, this RSC code irrespective of which branch of this bank you are in. Uh, and so there are two different sources we use. Uh, NPC ICH list, which I've mentioned previously, uh, documents each and every primary FSC of each and every uh, uh, bank. And this lets us know, for example, in the case of Solar Professional Bank, that their FSC code is HDFC0 SSUCB. And uh, uh, that lets us know, hey, this is the FSC code uh, for the sublet bank. Uh, there are also Excel sheets on the RBI that pub the Excel sheets published by RBI also occasionally have a bank name in the branch name field. Uh, and this this increases the list num uh, number of banks which have a sublet by a huge margin. Uh, these are not published directly. There are lots of cases where the banks may not even have a four character code. So it becomes much harder to roll it as well. Um, but uh, this brings up the number of banks within India by a lot, for example. Uh, and yeah, talking about the tech a bit, uh, it's fairly simple and boring. We have a scraper that runs uh, within Ruby slash bash. We have a release notes generator script, uh, which release uh, which generates release notes, takes a diff from the previous release to tell us what the uh, additional FSC codes that have been released or what are their uh, FSC codes that have been discontinued. Uh, there's also a patch manager that can fix issues by fix. I mean, uh, we can uh, pass a specific FSC or specific banks to disallow uh, things like NFT, for example, this is how we support uh, NFT blocks. Uh, if you want to try it out, this is a simple full line code. You can clone the entire thing, uh, go to the scraper, install the dependencies, and run the scraper. Uh, once the scraper runs out, you'll have the data directory, which will have uh, all the corresponding data sets in uh, JSON uh, format that you can actually check out and consume. Uh, this is how the patches usually look like. So, for example, 
the patch that I mentioned earlier, which uh, shut off uh, NEFT for six different banks. This is how it looks like. Uh, we can patch a specific bank and say, hey, NEFT for these specific branches is no longer permitted. Uh, similarly, we maintain, we use a patch for maintaining on the UPI live member list. So uh, we patch the data set to say UPI is supported for the specific or all of these banks. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of tests that I've written in over time to ensure uh, things remain consistent. And a lot of testing happens between uh, languages. So because we have a cross language framework to ensure uh, things are uh, same between all the different SDKs we are releasing, we have sets that we have tested are basically JSON files and we run the same exact same test across all the different languages. Uh, we also measure coverage between languages to say that, hey, uh, all the constants that are defined in PHP should also exist in Ruby in this case, uh, similar things for Node and so on. Uh, so yeah, uh, we also have the API. The API is also again open source. Uh, the API uh, exists in a separate repo by itself because we try to commit all the data set in the repository itself. There's a fairly large repo as a result, so cloning it may take time. Uh, the use case for committing all the data within the repo is to ensure we have a clean diff and the diff, diff can be used later on for actual use cases if you want to do analysis in terms of uh, branches moving or uh, branch contacts being changed, et cetera. Uh, makes it much more easier to do diff. Uh, it has a multi-stage Docker build, uses Ruby in order to actually serve all the requests. Uh, fairly simple code. Uh, but fairly highly performant. I've been running it for easily on very little resources for a long time now. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the future scope uh, of what all uh, we've been trying to do in the future for uh, the toolkit. Uh, one of the things is supporting Swift codes. Uh, Swift codes are tricky because they are entirely on the bank. Uh, to uh, So every bank may have its own standard. For example, HDFC has a common single Swift code across all their branches. While SPI has, uh, for like one to five percent of the branches, they have a Swift code which is vastly different. It doesn't follow any format at all. Uh, AAPS membership state is another thing we're trying to figure out. See if we can return AAPS true false for every uh, bank, and you should be able to do these checks with code. Uh, next is trying to figure out all the sublet branches, even the undeclared ones. So the declared branches are what shows up, for example, in the NPC ILS. The undeclared ones are which are hidden behind uh, uh, some Excel sheet somewhere which says the bank branch name is actually uh, uh, some specific urban cooperative bank. So you need to go through all the Excel sheets that RBA publishes, uh, go through all the branch names uh, and the branch addresses to actually figure out uh, that oh, uh, this, even though it starts with an HDFC, it's not, a, it's not an HDFC bank branch. So we document all the banks, even the undeclared slash dead ones. Uh, this is a uh, lot of uh, data on this in PDF format published on the RB website. Uh, but unfortunately, not all the banks, even though they're documented in different places, uh, they don't necessarily have a four character code, uh, which makes things slightly more different or difficult because you, you don't have a consistent official way uh, to refer to a specific bank. Uh, support for more languages. Uh, I think there's a fork for Python. Uh, we're trying to add support for Go. Uh, improve the API for uh, use cases. Uh, such as free text search, or for example, if you have a pin code, can you find out all the list of banks with that pin code, uh, or all the branches within that pin code, and so on. Uh, add support for hotlink bank logos and images. Uh, we already, for example, at Razorpay have a list of our, have a data set for this internally, but we're looking to see if we can publish this and make this much more easily consumable. So, for example, even if you're making the payments across uh, different places, if there's an easy standardized way to uh, have a bank logo being presentable. It makes things easier for other companies. Uh, this is uh, how, for example, these spatial sublets work. This is uh, uh, just a small subset of what it looks like. Uh, there are 1,500-ish plus uh, bank branches that are basically HDFC zero something something, but it happens to be a different bank. And as uh, you can see, spellings of cooperative once again differ. Uh, spellings for Kosekari again differ, and so on. Uh, so the RBI. So if you go to the RBI's official list, you can get some of these things out where they may have a declared uh, bank name for Shankar or Mohit Patil, Saikari Bank, for example. Uh, and that shows up in our list. Uh, just below this, I missed that out. Uh, but uh, the, the problem with this is, again, there's no given four-character code for the bank, so we don't have a single easy way 
actually the fourth of this bank within our code uh, and it makes things much more difficult. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's all I have. Uh, the slides are a little bit, uh, the uh, first link, and if you want to see the source of the slides, that's there as well. The toolkit itself is available at rcc.acp.com. Uh, if you'd like to take a look, links to the documentation, etc., uh, over here. And yeah, uh, that's it. I'll stop. Take a look at questions now. Yeah, so uh, I guess there was one question by Kiran uh, asking uh, if you'd like to hear more about how IFSC itself works. And there was also another question uh, by Grace on the event page, which uh, asked about if I made a payment to an incorrect bank account, is there a way to report the transaction? Uh, I think primarily both of these questions kind of confused the IFSC with the NEFT, uh, which is the payment system, whereas IFSC is like a routing code. Uh, so a rough analogy of sorts is like IFSC is like a DNS, which routes um, any payment instruction across different various payment networks. Uh, and say, for example, uh, if you have made an incorrect payment or if you want to report a transaction, you need to report as per the payment systems uh, operating guidelines and IFSC itself is like just the underlying routing code structures. Nimo, you want to add something on that? Yeah, mostly this, uh, Advita, uh, just to answer how does Razorpay handle this? It depends entirely, again, once again, on whether it's what kind of payment it is. If it's a credit card transaction, we, play, we can have a reversal. Uh, would like to uh, in case we have a credit card payment, we can ensure we can uh, push out the fund back to the source. Uh, but in case of an NEFT transaction, we can, for example, uh, decide, hey, uh, since the bank supports an IMPS transaction, we can actually do a refund via IMPS to this bank account and make it much more faster in general. Uh, so it depends entirely on what the actual uh, instrument uh, was used for the payment. Uh, uh, IFSC in general, once again, it's like in DNS, it's just a way to uh, tell us where the bank account itself is and which bank owns this bank account. Uh, so it's kind of uh, orthogonal. Uh, we have one more question. We do cross border payments to them. Ah, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, from is a question on cross-border payments to Indian bank accounts. Some banks who are on IM, uh, UPI or IMPS are not eligible to receive cross-border payments. Is there any data set available where you can figure out who can and can't get these transactions? This is something uh, I mentioned in the future scope of things. We are trying to, for example, integrate these sort of bank codes uh, within the uh, access data set. And the idea is, you know, you provide an access code, uh, which is uh, the place where your customer has a bank account. And you can get back a SIFT code in return. If you get a SIFT code in return, uh, you have a reasonable guarantee that you can actually make a transaction within the, to the bank account uh, internationally. But in case uh, you don't get a SIFT code, uh, you either need to figure out whether there's a SIFT code if our data set doesn't have it, uh, or you can assume that, okay, because there's no SIFT code, uh, we can't easily make a transaction. So yeah, uh, if, uh, there are some ways, but uh, the RFC to SIFT code mapping is not easily accessible. For example, uh, SBA publishes the list uh, you need to figure out from the addresses of the specific bank in the IFSC list and the address of the specific bank in the SBI SWIFT list and collate them together and see uh, if it still makes sense. Uh, there is one more question uh, on YouTube uh, around uh, Asking if is there any government restriction on using this data, like commercial use, etc. Asked by I mean, new M on YouTube. Uh, so uh, I've, uh, this is answered in the readme on the thing, but basically the readme says uh, we consider this data to be in public domain. Uh, all the data sets are published by RBI as such under public domain, uh, and uh, as such, I believe it's easy and accessible to use for everyone. Uh, I don't see any issues. With anyone using this, uh, our Reserve API has released all of the code within the MIT license as well. Uh, so the license for the all the code, uh, the code is under MIT, and the data sets are in public domain. That's our current stance. Nimo, you are on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm I'll repeat my answer. Uh, so uh, on the question of license, right? Uh, our current stance has been that 
all the code within our repository, which is the code that fetches it, uh, code that scrapes the data sets and the code that publishes and the code that uh, serves the API, for example, all of that is under MIT license. Uh, the data sets themselves are currently believed to be under public domain. Uh, so we publish them as such. So I don't see any use case issues that you may have uh, of using this data within commercial or non-commercial users. And there is one more question from Advait. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm just reading through that question. I'm not 100% sure what it means. Uh, neither RBA or not NTC have an updatable method for fresh or old FFE. So the way, yeah, the way it works is uh, uh, on the SFMS network every month the bank will push out a new list saying, hey, this is the list of all the FFCs we have, uh, and it's up to us as a consumer of that list to ensure that you know uh, the old things get removed. So we, what we do is uh, treat every data set as fresh in itself. So we, uh, which means. Uh, so we can do a diff from the previous release to the new release and say, hey, uh, these FFCs have been removed versus these FFC codes have been added. Uh, how the duplicate FFCs of a different, defunct banks reconcile from the regulator side. Uh, on this, uh, for example, uh, this is handled on a case-by-case -case basis once again. For example, for the SBA mergers that happened, uh, as we have published out a list within their own website saying this is on the left is the old IFFCs, on the right is the new IFFC codes. And they've been doing that uh, mostly for each and every new merger that has happened over time. Uh, but other banks may not follow it. For example, PNB mergers, there's no such list available. Uh, so, uh, and uh, what happens ultimately is that the old PNB, uh, old, for example, uh, the whichever bank or US bank, whichever ones got merged to PNB, uh, the IFFCs will keep getting published for some time and then they will stop getting published to the list, and then you have to assume that, hey, they are now getting published under the PUNB uh, namespace. So it, it goes on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, reconciliation is, I believe, entirely up to the bank. Uh, I think the RBA steps in for cases like Yes Bank, uh, where they want to ensure that things don't break, uh, but usually it's taken care of by the issuing banks. Okay, Zainab had posted uh, uh, why bank doesn't have liability or intervention powers in terms of a wrong transaction? How does this arbitration works for IFSC, IMPS, and UPI transactions? I think uh, just to clear it out, IFSC is the uh, routing code structure, so IFSC is not a payment system, whereas IMPS and UPI are payment systems, but uh, banks do not have intervention powers because they uh, operate on a network where the transactions are instantly settled. Uh, so they have to actually go through a formal process of uh, do a dispute resolution against uh, the network, which is NPCI in this case, and this whole process takes a while. And typically, in fact, uh, in a recent report, RBA existed, it takes up to 47 days for a dispute to get resolved uh, uh, through an ombudsman. So, so that's the average dispute resolution time that we know of. Uh, but I think we should kind of dig in more because there are different kinds of disputes uh, and, and different levels of uh, issues, both technical, non-technical, operational. And I think we should probably do maybe a small session on this sometime later. Yeah. And are there any more questions? Or are we getting to close? There are no questions open on the Zoom. Uh, let me see if there are questions on the YouTube. Uh, there is none. Okay. Uh, I think we'll formally close this session then. Uh, thank you for uh, attending today's event. We have an upcoming session on May 30th uh, by Kanchan Kumar, co-founder and CEO of Remitter, who will be speaking on AML in remittances, uh, data flows, and privacy. Uh, please visit the event page on hasgeek.com slash consumer and do uh, respond to the RSVP. We're also planning to come up with a study circle where we'll go deep dive into individual payment systems and narrower topics where we'll read through 
uh, and get to understand uh, specific areas uh, in a classroom setup. And please let us know your feedback on this session on the comment section of the event page or ping any of us. Uh, do let us know what other topics and talks you would like to hear. If you would like to talk about anything on payments, do let us know. And you can join our Telegram group uh, for any fintech chatter. We are at uh, t.me slash consumer. Uh, and uh, there's a poll that's run uh, uh, I think there's a poll that is in progress now uh, was this session useful was this events format participatory and yeah if you have uh, more comments on this particular topic you can go to the uh, event page and, the, and comment on the comment section anything on ifsc or branches that you want to ping nemo more to hear about it uh, yep thank you thanks everyone